Thanks for tuning in for the inaugural podcast of Demystifying Organizations, a podcast hosted by me, Jeff Shatton, and in partnership with McGraw-Hill Education. I want to give you a little background about my own professional experience and on the idea behind the podcast before we get started with the first episode. I'm a business administration professor at Washington and Lee University. My specific area is organizational behavior, which for those of you who are not familiar, is the arena that sits at the intersection of business and psychology. Or as Wharton's Adam Grant says, organizational behavior tries to help work suck less. Much of my published research is in negotiation and leadership, though my broad interests span across management, strategy, technology, and finance. Just a little more background. I have an MBA, a PhD, experience as a consultant in South Africa, and as a real estate investor. Okay, enough of my background. Let's move to the idea behind this podcast. Let's face it, when you were in college, I guess some of you are still in college, whatever your field of study was, you were probably exposed to a wide range of empirical studies, abstract theories, and ideas about the world. These could have been from sociology, ethics, or business, or the hard sciences. And these were nice. You liked them. They were interesting and challenged your understanding about yourself and your place in the world. They helped your critical thinking and the way in which you approach problems. But then you developed a career, a professional identity, and found that it was really difficult, if not impossible, to take an abstract idea, such as a theory of personality from psychology or one from behavioral finance or some other field, and actually apply it to the most difficult challenges that you face in your work life or at home for that matter. And this is the most common complaint that I hear in regards to the field of management. My students often say things along the lines of, it's good to know about the variables that make up employee motivation. What do I do with this knowledge? And yet, at the same time that our fields of study sit in the theoretical realm of the ivory tower, the world around us has gotten, how should I say it, but crazy. Think of it this way. What theory or empirical studies can you draw on to explain the Me Too movement? and what your division should do to best approach sexual violence. What do you draw upon to make sense of how your company or organization should respond to the rapid development of artificial intelligence, ubiquitous computing, and the automation of everything? How does one come to terms with the rise of authoritarianism as as a global leadership model? And what does this mean for leadership? And how can managers best monitor and inspire their subordinates? And how can one better understand the vital question of making work more meaningful? Whether you're an entrepreneur, an elementary school teacher, a mid-level manager at a bank, or an engaged member of your city council, these are questions that we all ask, and among dozens of others will be the focus of this podcast. Over the course of the upcoming months, and hopefully years if there's continued interest, I will bring on high-level experts to discuss the most interesting content that relates to the global challenges that confront us as professionals in the 21st century. In this podcast, I will interview professors and authors, but also business executives and government officials. The goal is to talk to anyone that has deep insight into the issues and challenges that modern organizations face. I will push my guests to connect theory, empirical findings, and best practices in order to try to do what I consider to be the hardest challenge, to take interesting abstract concepts and make them relevant to a wide-ranging audience. I hope that this podcast is both informative and interesting to listen to. Hopefully, you will emerge with a deeper understanding of some of the most fascinating topics that make modern work life complex and exciting, and can take meaningful steps toward building better teams, divisions, and organizations. At a minimum, I thought that by doing a podcast, I could get people to talk to me who would otherwise not give me the time of day. I hope you enjoy. Before we get started with today's guest, just a note, if you have questions or comments, you can email me at jeffshatton one at gmail.com. You can tweet me at Jeff Shatton. If you like this podcast, press the subscribe button and make sure to rate it on iTunes so that other people can find it. My guest today is Daniel Pink. Daniel is the author of six provocative books, including his newest, When, The Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing, which spent four months on the New York Times bestseller list and was named a best book of 2018 by Amazon, iBooks, Goodreads, and several more outlets. His other books include the long-running New York Times bestseller, 
A Whole New Mind, and the number one New York Times bestseller, Drive, and To Sell as Human. His books have won multiple awards and have been translated into 39 languages. I've personally used much of Pink's work in my organizational behavior classes and encourage you to buy his new book, When. You should also check out his TED Talk, which is one of the most watched TED Talks ever. I'd like to welcome to the podcast, Daniel Pink. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. So most of our lives, we're asking questions about why, which is my three-year-old asks why. Um, my my almost two-year-old is starting to ask why. How did you move from that to this important question of when? Well, I still think it's important to ask why. I mean, I, I actually think that one of the problems is that once we get past, say, age six or seven, we, we stop asking why enough. So I'm still a big believer in asking why. But when it comes to organizations, um, uh, we do ask why every once in a while. We certainly ask what we're going to do. We ask who's going to do it. That's why we have HR. We ask how we're going to do it. That's learning and development. But when it comes to when we do things as individuals and organizations, we just don't take the question seriously. And that's a mistake because there is a ginormous body of research spread across many disciplines, but a ginormous body of research showing that these questions of when matter in our performance and our well-being and uh -huh. the evidence gives us some ways to make better when decisions and so a lot of the stuff that you outline is arguing that certain times of the day are better for us performance wise than others right um would you like maybe lay out some of your arguments um on that front sure so so what the so um there, there's a you know as with with thing as with any kind of research, there's nuance to it, so it isn't as black and white as some people would would want to make it. But let me try to make it as to explain it at you know at a level as simple as possible uh, without being overly simplistic. And it, and it's this: most of us move through the day. We, most of us people move through the day in three broad stages: a peak, a trough, a recovery. During our peak, that's when we are most vigilant. Vigilance means we're able to bad away distractions. That makes the peak the time for best performance on uh, what we can think of as analytic tasks, which are tasks that require heads down, focus, and attention. During the trough, um, that's our worst time of day. And for almost all of us, it's the early to mid-afternoon. That's our worst time of day. Um, and during and and performance declines significantly across a many in, in many many domains. So that's the time we shouldn't be doing work that requires massive brain power or creativity. Instead, we should be doing administrative work, work that you know is relatively easy, doesn't take a huge cognitive load or massive amounts of of of, of, of insight. The third stage, or is the recovery stage. Now, this is an interesting stage uh, because in typically our mood is higher, but we're less vigilant. And that makes it a good time for what psychologists call, social psychologists call insight tasks, tasks that require more um, coming up with non-obvious solutions, uh, uh, solving problems that don't bend to pure analysis or mathematical logic. So now most of us, one other thing to add here is that most of us move through the day in that order, a peak, a trough, a recovery, peak early in the day, trough middle of the day, recovery late in the afternoon and into the evening. However, so, it's, so what's interesting, though, is that we structure our organizations and our teams around a constant equilibrium, right? Exactly. I mean, most, most people out there are working from 9 to 5, or if you're an investment banker, maybe from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., or whatever those hours are, it, it's pretty much expected that you are equal around during that work time, um, and, and nothing is really delineated. Precisely. That is exactly the challenge that we are up against. The pres you got it perfectly, Jeff. The, the presumption is that our cognitive abilities are static throughout the day. And that is fundamentally not true. All right. That, I mean, and, and it, you know, and while there is nuance in a lot of the specific research findings, that claim right there, I can definitively say, is not true. Our cognitive abilities change over the course of a day. They they change in material ways. They change in some in, in some predictable ways. And the best time to do something often depends on what it is we're actually 
what it is we're actually doing. And so how would so how would you if so if if you're a, if you're managing five people on a team, uh, how how would you manage them differently uh, given this information? Well, let me let me let me round out the 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 explanation about this pattern of the day with one other very very important dimension, and then I can and because that's going to help me answer that question. So, as I said, peak trough recovery. Most of us move through the day, you know, in that order. However, some of this. Much of the, the 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 way we pass through the day is dependent in heavy part on what's known as our chronotype, which is our which is essentially our propensity. Do we wake up early and go to sleep early? Do we wake up late and go to sleep late? And there is that is uh, th- that is not unidimensional. That's there there is it's there's a distribution of of chronotype across the population. We know about. So you're, so you're talking about my my brother who stays up late into the night, goes to bed at two a.m., wakes up at ten a.m. and starts his cycle. Then, right? That's it, it, and and I think a lot of conventional view would say, "Oh my god, your brother's a slacker." Oh, he's a, no. Your brother is a has an evening chron almost certainly has an evening chronotype. He's an owl. And here's the thing: about twenty percent of the population is that way. Uh, now, about fifteen percent of the population are very strong larks. That is, they get up early and go to sleep early, and about two thirds of the population are in the middle. Um, but again, to, to bring it down to its the level of greatest simplicity without making it simplistic, we can think of it this way: that about four to five of us move through the day peak trough recovery. Owls, your brother moves through the day very differently. And the thing about owls is that they hit their peak, their analytic peak, much, 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 much later in the day. Five in the afternoon, six in the afternoon, 10 in the evening. Um, and so, so, that's, so it's important to understand that while we have generally these three stages, people can move through them in different sequences based on their chronotype, which leads me to your question. So one of the things that I would want to know in your in, in this five person team that I'm dealing with is what are the chronotypes of these people and and there are various scientifically validated assessments to to get a, to get a handle on that so let's say that the distribution is roughly the same as the distribution of the population so I have one hardcore lark one hardcore owl and three people in the middle what that generally means is is that f- I'll tell you what I'll tell you what it means for that let's say Okay, what I what I here's what I don't want to do, especially for that group. All right. I don't want to have an 8 30 a.m. staff meeting. Here's why. I want those the four people who aren't owls at 8 30. That's generally their peak, you know, r- roughly around there. I don't want I want them to do whatever heads down work, analytic work they have to do, uninterrupted, unencumbered by my meeting. Likewise, that owl. I probably don't even want her to come into the office at 8.30 in the morning. I don't want to demand that she's at an 8.30 in the morning meeting because she probably wants to roll into the office around 10 in the the morning. So that's one thing that that I won't do. What I will try to do as much as possible as a manager is protect the space for people to do, you know, to, to actually operate unmolested in their peak of vigilance. So that Al... I'm going to say for her, you know what, if she wants to do her heads down work between seven in the evening and 10 in the evening, even if I am not there, that's cool. That's what I want to, that's what I want to do with her now. So so part of the, part of this is about education and reflection, right? So one is going to be to educate um, individuals about their own cycle, which most people are not aware of. Correct. um, And kind of help them think through when they're most productive and when they'll, they'll be best to work on different things. Absolutely right. Uh, absolutely right. So you're, so that's part of it is just our own, you know, essentially self knowledge. Um, but at the same time, uh, y- you know, I- I- as you, as you, as you said in your question, it's like some of the onus is on the manager to adapt the situation, to adapt the, the, the setting to the people as much as possible. Now here's the thing. Okay. So, so, so you're never going to get it perfect. But you can make it better. So, so, so again, I want to protect those analytic spaces for for people. Here's the other thing: I don't want to have an important product review meeting at two o'clock in the afternoon. That's an exceptionally bad idea. Everyone's going to be at their worst. Instead, if I have to have a meeting about the travel voucher policy, that's what I'm going to do at two in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. Um, now, for something like brainstorming, this is interesting because we do have some we do have a mix of, of people here. 
for brainstorm for a brainstorming meeting, since I have the bulk of people, I'm just stipulating that they're not owls. For the brainstorming meeting, what I might want to do is something like this. Um, what we know is that for most, for you know, eighty percent of us, late in the day and into the early afternoon, as I mentioned, we're less vigilant, but we're, in a, we're our mood actually goes up. And so that kind of mental looseness makes it a good time for iterative tasks, like, like let's say like brainstorming. So what I might want to do there is have my brainstorming session with the team, let's say at five in the evening, and maybe have my owl participate in that, but also maybe put her in a role where she's actually not generating the ideas in the brainstorming, but subsequently evaluating the ideas in the mm-hmm. brainstorming. So a little, a, a more analytic task. Um, and so it's things like that. Now, you're not always going to get it perfect, but I think if you're conscious of it and as a manager, and as you say, if people are conscious of their own um, best times, people are going to get more work done, they're going to get better work done, and they're going to feel better. I thought the one of the most surprising findings that you that you mentioned in the book um, is that this extends to pretty high stakes areas, not just um, an Excel sheet, but that judges are more likely to grant leniency to an inmate if that inmate is presented them to them in the morning than in the afternoon. Um, yeah, in general, yeah, and also and also after breaks, they they tend to be um, they tend to be more they tend to be more lenient. Now, I think what's going on here. It, it, it just in general is um, that it, it goes, it, and you're totally right about that. What you also see is it is it is is in so many different domains. You see differences in performance based on time of day. You see it monumentally in healthcare, where healthcare outcomes, physician nurse performance is different in the morning versus the afternoon. You yeah, see- so, so I think so I think this is the this is the most challenging question, right? So something like judges are going to see inmates throughout the day. Um, physicians are going to perform surgeries throughout the day. Yeah. We can't have everybody going to their surgeon in the morning. Right. Um, there's that question of a Kant's categorical imperative, right? If everybody everybody can't go do one thing at once, it wouldn't be good, even if that's right. the ideal time. Right. So how do, how do we structure broader things like judges and surgeons, um, given that their performance is so dramatically impacted by a uh, time of day? Yeah, it's a really, it's a really, it's a really important, que- it's a really important question. And once again, there's no way to do that. I think step one is to be aware of these differences in performance. And step two is to actually be deliberate about things like Okay, in each of these settings, things like breaks um, and even things like checklists. What can we do during this downdraft to restore vigilance? And one of the things that we know restores vigilance is taking a break. And as I mentioned in the study that you referred to about those judges granting parole, judges were more likely to grant parole after breaks as well. Um, so, uh, and if you, and in, in, in medical settings, uh, let's say surgery or something like that, Taking essentially a timeout and going over a checklist has pl- has been uh, monumentally important in improving medical outcomes. So, what we need to do in those moments of declining performance is take breaks, take take timeouts, and maybe even go to uh, re- rely more on a checklist. I don't think there's anything wrong with a ju- excuse me. I don't think there's anything wrong with a judge. Relying on a checklist. I don't right. think so, so the function of the checklist asking the same questions, you know, the same basic questions to every person uh, coming before her. Yeah. So the function of a checklist is kind of like a seatbelt, right? You don't want to have to. It, it's it's not for the times that you're driving well. It's for the times that you get in an accident. Perfectly said. Um, and there's other ways that people can have these barriers of safety um, beyond right beyond checklists, right? There's routines. Um, you know, that if you get into the same routine, no matter what time of day um, that you're, whether that's a, whether that's a teacher with her, uh, her elementary school students, or whether that's a manager with her, with, with, uh, with their team, um, that routines can help uh, provide that kind of safety so that you make sure that there's uniformity across different areas. It can, it can mitigate some of the downslide. I don't think it can fully arrest it, that these diurnal patterns are really, are really powerful. And so you see it now in, for instance, there's a really fascinating study out of NYU looking at the transcripts of 26,000 public company earnings calls using a piece of software that measured the emotional valence of the words, 
showing that even if you control for the fundamentals uh, in what a company is, is reporting, afternoon calls were more negative, irritable, and combative than, than morning calls. And so here you have, you know, if you think about that, to me, that's a really important study because if you think about the, the actors in that study, okay, you've got CEOs and, and CFOs of public companies, generally pretty experienced people. They're very well prepared and they have a lot of stake. And even that is not enough to fully hold back the, the changes in diurnal, uh, uh, in diurnal patterns. And so, you know, it might be actually worth, it's difficult to do, but worth tinkering with some of the master schedule in hospitals or in courtrooms so that they do a little bit more in the morning and they do different kinds of things in the in the afternoon. So a judge could say have, I, and I'm not saying this is a good idea, what I'm saying is that it's a way to think about it. So a judge could have something like have the trial, again, in general, assuming mornings are better for that judge making better decisions. The judge, let's say it's a trial judge, the trial judge could, could, could schedule trials for the morning and more mundane kind of status hearings and things for the afternoon rather than having the mundane status hearings, which is often the case, these mundane administrative status hearings, and then clearing the decks there and then going to the trial itself. So um, moving to another topic uh, where you talk about beginnings, we, we've, we've long known that schools and test scores and students would do better if we started them later in the day. Um, and and you, you point to a bunch of studies that, um, that, that, that confirm that. Why are we so reluctant, given that that's pretty well established, to um, to do something like that, to make a major change, um, given that it has dramatic effect on student education? Yeah, the, the the effect of school start times is really more about not about all students, but really about teenagers. Uh, for little kids, uh, you, know, el- you know, basically elementary school kids, preteen kids, uh, school is perfectly fine to start pretty early. Because those, because because little kids. I mean, you're a father of two little kids. You know, little kids are very larky. They get oh, yeah. up really early, start running around like we're, crazy we're, people. We're five. Yeah, no, no. Exa- yeah, no exactly. Question. And that's and that's uh, you know part a biological fact in many cases. So for so for elementary school students, starting school at seven thirty is totally fine mm-hmm. in most cases. It's really when you get to the teen years when people have a change in chronotype where there's a massive move toward lateness. And as you say, uh, the evidence is overwhelming that schools should start later for teenagers. I mean, it's really, it's one of those things, it's not much of a close call. You have the entire, basically every pediatrician in the country urging schools to start a little bit later for, for teenagers. We're not talking about starting at, you know, one in the afternoon. We're talking about starting at 9.15 rather than 7.45. Um, and so why is there the resistance? I, it, you know, it's a good question. I think we can speculate on that. I, my view is actually a fairly cynical view, which is that it's inconvenient for adults. Uh, parents, parents would rather drop off their teenagers with their elementary school students at the same time. Uh, coaches would rather have kids get out of school earlier so they can have longer afternoon practices. Teachers uh, are used to that kind of schedule and don't want to, you know, are, they're perfect. You know, a 43 year old teacher is perfectly capable. You know, and, and again, there's some self-selection in professions uh, based on chronotypes. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a disproportionate number of larks as, as teachers because school starts early. So a 43 year old teacher is totally great on starting school at 730 in the morning because uh, and getting out at three in the afternoon because that works for him. Um, so I really think it's it's essentially adults opting for their own convenience over what we know is right for kids' physical, mental, and educational well-being. Because this is where it kind of ties in that to the management question, right? So the, the study that you talk about um, says shows that if you start school um, late, I mean, it was an hour, an hour and a half, that it increased graduation rates by 11%. Yeah. Now, let's imagine that we put a dollar value to um, to a local school board or to the state or to the federal government about what it would what is it worth to have high schoolers graduate 11 percent higher graduation rates? Um, and then what would the what would the cost of that program be? It would be it'd be a no brainer. Um, and yet th- this would this would die on committee as soon as it gets um, mentioned because people are going to oppose it. Um, and I think it gets to the broader the broader question of of why this question of when is so difficult to implement. 
yeah. right, is that you pretty quickly on any of these win uh, studies, you end up going up against really entrenched human behaviors that you know that have that have been going. That we have we have customs going around it for a very long time, like like the school system. Um, so I'm curious what you think about kind of that big question about how you overcome the on the one hand these win findings that showcase that timing really matters, and then where we see with whether that's corporations or when they uh, release a re- release their uh, quarterly reports, um, whether that's um, the schools and when they start. And kind of the opposition, what we what we can expect to this kind of change. Yeah, I, I think that's a terrific question, and and once again, I don't think there's a I don't think there's an easy answer to it. I, I think part of it is well, I have a, view, a different a set of views on that. Number one is that any kind of the sort of the broad scale change and entrenched behavior that you're describing. It takes a long time to do. If you think about any kind of entrenched behaviors in societies, they don't, they're not extinguished overnight. They're gradually chipped away on. And it, it, at some level, we're at the very beginning, we're at the very, very, very beginning stages of trying to chip away at this. Um, and so if you think of it as a long-term proposition in the same way that we change public attitudes on smoking or we change public attitudes on uh, drunk driving, or we change public attitudes on, you know, on on, uh, on littering. Those that uh, those those took generally those took generally decades. I do think that there is something to be said for the for the exactly as you said, Jeff, for the cost benefit argument here, because there there is one paper, a good paper that looked at Wake County, North Carolina school district, and found that. This is actually a very cost-effective policy change for schools, and so I think set, I think arguing this in terms of cost-effectiveness and results is a way to do it. I also and, and crime and crime reduction, and because we are we know so much of the long tail effects of high school graduation. Oh, I, I mean that especially if you just take that dimension right there. If you just take because what we all, what they also saw in school districts that have pushed back the start times is you see. Uh, higher test scores, uh, less teen depression. Uh, there's a big study out um, uh, several districts in the Western United States showing a decline in auto and teen auto accidents. But I, I like your idea. Like let's just, let's just take that dropout thing. The, a high school there's there's the human cost of that particular kid not making it out of high school. But as you say, there are these cascading costs to all of us for that kid not graduating from high school. And if this is one way to move the needle a little bit. I mean, it's crazy not to do this, but we see this in other kinds of public policy. For instance, it's cr- like we know, forget about the, well, it's a little bit related to timing. We know how important in child development and in outcomes as adults, the period between zero and three is in a, in a, young per- in a person's life. Those three years are extraordinarily important. And if that, and, and if that child is, is, well nourished, um, well taken care of, loved, stimulated intellectually, that that is incredibly important. And so the idea why we are spending not we're not spending a, a lion's share of our of our social services budget on that when we know that's the cost effective thing to do is crazy. So we so we see this problem in, in other areas. I think the way to solve it is 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 in part by making the cost benefit our argument by playing the long game, trying to change this over time. And also by uh, I do think that that one reason for the entrenchment and I like your word there is is people are people are risk averse. They don't want to change because mm-hmm. they don't want to be the first people to do it. And so the more you can accumulate some first movers and hold them up as examples, then I think you might be able to pick off more, more and more. But um, this is a, you know, it, this is, I, I look at this as a, a problem to solve over, you know, a decade or two, not something that we can fix right. overnight. And here's the thing, you know, and there've been attempts too, just as there always been attempts to make other kinds of changes and they often get rebuffed. So this fall in California, California legislature passed a law um, that's uh, mandating that school districts for teenagers push back their school start times. I don't. I think it was to like nine or nine fifteen, and the governor vetoed it. And this is a prog- you know Jerry Brown, a progressive governor. Interesting. 
there's a there's there's a, some compelling work that uh, that you cite on the effect of deadlines. So how we think of when a deadline's approaching, how we think of it when we're halfway there, how we think of it when it's when it's coming due. And so can you give us the overview of how you think of deadlines and its function in terms of uh, performance? Well, part of it depends. Um, and there, you know, I like to go back to the, it, it's not fairly old. And, and, and as an OB professor, you, you, know, you know all this. I, I like to go back to, on deadlines per, on deadlines in general, um, I like to go back to the work of Teresa Mobile, who, you know, a couple decades ago did a lot of the research. And I, to oversimplify her work, it, it essentially says that that for algorithmic tasks, deadlines improve performance. For heuristic tasks, they don't necessarily improve performance. And I think that that, I think that that general principle holds true. What we also see is other kinds of behavior that when an end of anything becomes more salient, more visible, people will kick a little harder. So you see this in um, in things like research on on gift certificates. So you give one group a gift certificate that expires in two months, and you give another one a gift certificate that expires in three weeks the group that has three weeks is more likely to cash in the gift certificate, which in some ways makes no sense because they had significantly less time. But for them, the ending was more salient or even in sort of the more, uh, you know, even in some of the research that from Adam Alter at NYU and Hal Hirschfield at UCLA about when people are most likely to run their first marathons when they get to the nine years, 29, 39, 49, because a decade, because a, because a decade is ending. But you also see, again, you're an OB professor, you know this, you also see the work of, of Connie Gersick showing that getting to the midpoint of a project is one of the things that often will galvanize people. Right. So, so midway through, right, people start focusing yeah. um, and you can extend, you can extend a lot of like a bigger project for a longer deadline and teams will dilly dally for a little bit. And then once they're pretty close to that midway point, they start kicking it into high gear. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, and I, and what's interesting about Connie Gersick's work is that there's often someone l- like literally saying out loud like basically issuing a, a temporal signal, it's literally saying out loud, oh man, we've hit the halfway point. Oh, we've wasted half of our time. Um, and so I think the interesting thing there, I think there are a lot of interesting questions in that research. Uh, one of them is, okay, does that mean that we could squeeze down the amount of time we give people? Therefore, they hit the midpoint sooner and get to work sooner. So so would, say, giving a team... Um, 20 days for a project be as, val- you know, would, would they get, suppose we gave a team 20 days for a project and we gave a team 30 days for a project. Would that 20 day team do just as well? I think the other interesting question though, and I, I don't, I don't have, I mean, maybe you have a perspective on well, this. So it depends. It depends. So it depends what they're doing during that first part, right? Well, um, so there's, there's, there's a, assuming that they're meeting and actually doing something productive. That's when, our, you know, some of the good brainstorming goes on. Right. It's the, uh, that initial formation of the team, um, some of the social cues and social, right. The, the relationships build, assuming you have a team that has not worked together before. Um, so there's some key parts early on, um, but there's not that pressure. And that's why deadlines are so important, because without deadlines, um, people just will kick the can down the road. Well, this is exactly that's exactly where I was going to in that in that in that as a second question. So 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 one thing is, you know, um, and I don't know any experiments on this is is experimenting with duration, uh, the, d- duration and allowing people to hit the midpoint faster. It would give them less time, but m- maybe they would have the same level of performance if, you know, not, I'm not saying, you, you know taking a, a year long project and making it a two week project, but, sure. but chipping down a, a little bit. But I think the other point you make is actually really interesting. That is, you know, the way that Gersick talks about um, this, this research at the, or the, this, the effect of the midpoint is really about, you know, activity and like really doing stuff and, you know, and, and rolling up the sleeves and doing the things that are required to create the work product or whatever. And, and I, and there is a sense that that first half is people are unfocused, maybe doing dilly dallying. I think another way to look at that is the way that you are, which is that there is something happening in that first half that is essential. It's just less active. It's less explicit. Well, and, and it doesn't, and you don't see the deliverables. Right, right. And so it could be that that's just a necessary, there's a necessary incubation period 
for for that. Um, it, it, it goes a little bit to some of the research on on procrastination, where there's like not all procrastination is negative. There's a there's there there can be productive forms of procrastination that are really less about delaying the inevitable and more about incubating and not moving until you're a little bit further along and more ready. As someone who is, uh, I'm 37 years old, so I'm, I'm almost 40. Um, I, I like the part about dispelling the myth of uh, the midlife crisis. Yeah, total nonsense. And, and why, why is the midlife crisis nonsense? There's no evidence of it. it. I mean, this is one of those things. It drives, this, this actually drives me nuts. Because if you go, you know, you walk down the streets of, I'm based in Washington, D.C. You walk down the streets of Washington, D.C., you walk down the streets of Lexington, Virginia, you know, essentially anywhere in America, and you say, you use the phrase midlife crisis, people will know what you mean. Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they think it's true. Meanwhile, there has been zero evidence, empirical evidence of a midlife crisis. And the genesis of this was a paper from the 1960s by a French Canadian psychoanalyst named Elliot Jacques, where he just basically asserts it. I mean, I mean, it, it, in in a way that's that to me to continues to boggle my mind, and it's somehow stuck in the parlance. So there isn't this dramatic bottoming out in midlife. But what you do see, and here there is enormous empirical evidence, is something gentler, quieter, which is a, a slump. There's what what these research call a, a U-shaped curve of well-being, where if we think about well-being on the vertical axis and, and, and age, time of life on the horizontal axis, people tend to have higher well-being in their 20s and 30s, Late 30s, around your age, it begins to decline. Uh, declines into the 40s, the early 50s. My age, okay, you're at the nadir, but it's a shallow you. And then, as time goes on, late 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond, well-being actually goes up. So there is a midlife gentle slump, which has been found in something like 70 countries around the world. It's not an American or a Western phenomenon. Um, but there isn't anything like a midlife crisis where the bottom falls out and people dramatically remake their lives. And so part of this is perspective taking, right? Is this, is this about being on the timeline and, and knowing where you are on the timeline as to why people in their life happier than let's say when they're 35 or 45? That's a good question. I, I actually don't think that the research actually gives us an answer to that. I think we can speculate on it, but the research on the U-shaped curve of well-being doesn't necessarily give us very clear answers to that. Now, I think we can speculate on it. Um, I think part of it, but it, but again, I just want to recognize that it's speculation. So, yeah, sure. one, so 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 one of the things is that um, you know around the middle of life you start uh, you start reckoning with that in, in many cases that your uh, the reality of your life is not going to measure to the dreams of your life. So you might you, you don't have a perfect marriage. You might have a broken marriage. Um, you you want deeply fulfilling relationships with your children, and maybe you don't have them. You want to be CEO of your company, but it ain't going to happen to you. Mm-hmm. So you have these like sort of disappointments. That could be one reason for the dip. When you coming out of the dip, it could be, and again, I'm speculating here, that you essentially recalibrate your expectations. And you say, um, you know, okay, I my first marriage didn't work, but I'm now in a second marriage and that's more satisfying. Or I actually have better relationships with my kids now that they're adults rather than when they were littler. Or It's okay that I didn't become CEO because I actually left that company, started a small business. I'm not making as much money as I did before, but I feel like I'm doing something more true to myself. So that's possible, sort of recalibration of expectations. I think that I think part of it could be um, uh, some uh, uh, different level of social comparison. Uh, So social comparison, perhaps in the middle of our life, is more about. Uh, external things like professional, perhaps external things like professional accomplishment or pr- appearance or uh, wealth. Whereas as people mature even more, they realize that the social comparison that we, sh- we should be making is things like, do I have people I love and who love me? Do right. I have fulfilling relationships? Am I living a life of purpose? And so it could be different form of social comparison. It could be some form of gratitude because the older you get, the more you have people around you dying. 
it could be that, um, which I think is an interesting hypothesis it, that goes to the work of Laura Carstensen at Stanford, showing that as people get older, they end up shedding, um, uh, they end up shedding a lot of relationships. So and the from, secondary and out yeah, external, yeah, the distant yeah, relationships get shed. And focusing on the core relationships, and what we know from a lot of work is, you know, particularly things like the Grant study out of Harvard, uh, you know, the the long term, very very long term study of Harvard graduates from like the nineteen thirties or something like that. What we also know from a lot of the work on well being is that. Uh, uh, basically, relationships and love form the core of enduring significant well-being, and so yeah. people could be in focusing on that more than they did in the hustle and bustle of their earlier years. I think that's it's really really interesting. Yeah. Um. So you went to India to study the. I'm going to ma- ma- probably mess up the name. The Dabawalas. Yep. Um, which is a, it's a very famous um, Harvard uh, business case study. <laughs> That you'll, you'll, you you'll study in your MBA. You sit as a te- as a professor. That case, I studied it when I was getting my MBA. Oh, okay, but you haven't used it. You haven't taught it. I have not. Uh huh. So what uh what attracted you to go to India to study that, and and what did you what did you get out of that uh, experience? Well, what I was interested in was how groups coordinate and synchronize in time. And what I wanted was a really interesting, vivid example of that. And it, 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 this is, this is, um, the double. So describe, uh, describe what they do. Yeah. It's actually pretty remarkable. And, and it, and it definitely merits a, 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 a business school case study. Uh, these are, so it's important to understand some of the Indian sort of the, the middle, upper middle, really upper middle class Indian culture. And uh, what you have in, there is, is, uh, people who work, well-educated people who work, they usually live far away from the downtown business area, uh, and so they commute into work. And there is this preference at lunchtime for home-cooked meals rather than for, you know, Chick-fil-A. And um, <laughs> although I love Chick-fil-A, um, or you know Chipotle, I like Chick-fil-A better than Chipotle. But we don't need to talk about my quick-service restaurant preferences. Um, but but basically, for you know more what are considered more healthful home-cooked meals, uh, the problem is is that in a in a in a place like Mumbai, where I was, they're long, painful commutes. You leave early in the morning. No one's going to get up at four in the morning to cook you a home-cooked meal. But they might get up at seven or eight to cook your home cooked meal because you also have a lot of you have upper middle class people with cooks and you also have a lot of multi-generational households where mostly like the moms and grandmas would be cooking so essentially what happens is this uh, mom grandma cook will will actually cook a delicious like hot good lunch for, for the son or daughter who's you know, the 30 something son or daughter who's working in downtown, then the, the person, the cook will put it in these, these metal tiffins. Um, you know, it's like the chapate and the rice and the lentils and whatever else, dal, whatever other kind of stuff they're serving. Now the challenge then becomes that then it becomes a challenge of logistics. How do you get that home cooked lunch 20 kilometers away in suburban Mumbai to the downtown of this crazy out of control city? Right. And so if you were to do this, if, I'm just going to step in. If, yeah. if you were to do this here, there'd be an app yeah. and then the um, the driver would come pick it up based on the geolocation and it'd be geolocated downtown um, and that would be it. But that's not how they got their uh, uh, Harvard Business Review article. Not even close because, again, this has been around for a while. This, has been, this, this service has been around way before geolocation, way before smartphones. And what these folks do is uh, uh, these men, they ride around on bicycles. They pick up the lunches at the apartments. Uh, they, they, they carry them on their backs. They, the lunches each have a code, not a UPC code, but literally a hand-scrawled code written on them. They use that code to then sort the lunches uh, at the train station. So they resort them based on where the lunches are going. Then these men, the Davawalas, they get on the train with a certain number of lunches. They take the, the commuter train down to downtown Mumbai. They then resort them based on the more specific delivery locations of buildings and things like that. They put them on their back and they carry them to the offices and stores where people are working. 
um, deliver these lunches, and then the double walls go off to have their lunch, and then they come in. This is the thing that really just blew my mind. They come and they pick up the empties collect them again and do the whole thing in reverse, get back on the train, go back and, and deliver the, and deliver the, um, the, the, the now empty containers back to the homes of the people who, who cook the food. And now right, so the, the thing that got them the Harvard business article is that it's considered a six Sigma process, which means that the error rate is something like three and some million uh, attempts. Yeah. It's so out of, out of however ever million attempts, um, they make under they make under just a few um, errors. Right, which is remarkable. Now that six sigma fact has been I haven't seen it actually verified anywhere. Okay, um, but they do it with extraordinary accuracy. So even in my own reporting, I found no one who had had an errant delivery, uh, and I asked that question basically to everybody I talked to. And um, and the other thing is that you had places like FedEx coming to study them, UPS, DHL coming to study them. I think the most remarkable thing, which you alluded to earlier, Jeff, is that they do this essentially without technology. They don't have – it's not like an Uber where the recipient is, follow, is following your path. Um, they, 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 base, they use um, the, the train schedule, uh, this cryptic marking code and bicycles in their own sense of the neighborhood to make all of these deliveries. And I, I've always been curious about, like, I mean, as you said before, suppose we were fit, you know, you're teaching an entrepreneurship class and you have this, this gap in the market where you have people who want home cooked lunches, people who are willing to make the home cooked lunches, but no way to get the lunches from one place to another. How do you solve for that? And I'm wondering whether even using today's technology, you would have anything as effective as these, these Daba Wallace. And so what was, what was your takeaway from, from that visit? Well, I mean, I think it's uh, – what I was trying to do is, is it, uh, can we extract any general principles about group coordination and group synchronization? Because these folks are deeply, deeply synchronized with each other. And so what I was looking at is – you know, and, and you see this a little bit with. I was always fa- I was fascinated with choirs. How are choirs so well synchronated? Uh, how are rowing teams well synchronated, sy- synchronized? Um, and so, what it's trying to do is use them to derive some general principles. And I think the general principles are for synchronization: the importance of having a very clear boss. In the Dabo Wallace case, it's the it's the clock. It's a particular train, a particular clock, a particular schedule. Um, in the, um, in the choir cases, it's, it's, you have a choir director who has a very interesting role. Uh, the choir director, uh, literally faces a different direction from the rest of the choir. He's literally the only member of the group who doesn't make a sound. And the same thing is trim- similar to say the coxswain on a, a rowing team. That person is literally facing a different direction from the rest of the team and, is the only person who's not touching an oar. And so having a clear boss seems to matter. Um, a sense of belonging is extraordinarily important. I mean, we see this in a lot of the belonging research. So how do we foster belonging? Uh, and then also, I, what I think is also interesting is this sense of purpose. Um, that is, the, the, the Wallas, Dabba Wallas know why they're doing this. They, 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 have a, they have a transcendent purpose. It isn't the kind of thing that is you know, some kind of lame corporate mission statement etched on uh, the wall of corporate headquarters. It's something that they actually do talk about. And so a clear boss, a sense of belonging, and a clear purpose seems to be at least some of the main ingredients for how groups synchronize. And and, uh, and you also talked about uh, team cohesion with the NBA players. Oh, yeah. Where- where so if the the more physical contact that they have that you see on the court um, the, the predicts uh, points and uh, and wins. Yeah, it predicts, and and there's and and I it, this is uh, you know it's a it's a it's a it's a delicate topic, obviously, in organizational behavior of touching. <laughs> um, and, but it, but it's but a different it, culture. It's a different culture in the NBA class. Exactly, exactly. But it, but 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 the thing is, is like actually touching is a sign of can be a sign of belonging. And and it, what I loved about that paper was they they listed like the kinds of things that people were counting. You know, fist bumps, chest bumps, head bumps. Mm-hmm. You know, those kinds of things. But I, but it is it is a sense of you know touch in 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 the in particular cultures does 
foster a sense of belonging. Shared language has a, fosters a sense of belonging. Uh, clothing can foster a sense of belonging. Um, uh, you know, things like um, uh, inside jokes or uh, self-created rituals can foster that sense of belonging. And, and, and we know from a lot of other research on teams that, that belonging, psychological safety are enormously po- powerful in helping teams cohere. All right. Well, I think we're, we're about out of time. I want to thank, uh, thank Daniel Pink for coming on the podcast. His book is Win, The Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing. It is out right now, so you can all go and buy it. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Thanks for listening to the podcast today. If you have any questions or comments, you can email me at jeffshatton1 at gmail.com. You can tweet me at Jeff Shatton. If you like this podcast, press the subscribe button and make sure to rate it on iTunes so that other people can find it.